Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you very much for taking the time to join us for this conversation. My name is Hosea Suleiman. I am the Joint Artistic Director of Checkpoint Theatre. Since our founding in 2002, we've been focused on developing, producing, promoting original Singapore work for the stage and across other platforms and media. Joining us for this wonderful conversation is Dr. Joanne Yong. Joanne holds a number of concurrent appointments, Senior Economist at the University of Southern California, uh, Director of the Center for Economic and Social Research, Founder of Research for Impact Singapore, Visiting Associate Professor at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, NUS, Honorary Senior Lecturer at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Economist at Rand Corporation. Uh, as to her training, she holds a PhD in economics from Stanford, and her undergraduate degree was in economics and applied and computational mathematics from Princeton University. So it's a real privilege to talk to Joanne about Singapore beyond the circuit breaker, about how society has changed, will change, must change, or should change, uh, and the hard questions that we have to ask for this change to happen. Today's conversation is going to go on for about 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute question and answer. So please comment on the Facebook video with your questions and we will answer as many as time permits. Finally, I invite you to make a donation to Checkpoint Theater at giving.sg to help us continue making original Singapore work and facilitating important conversations. Hello, Joanne. Hi, who's here? I'm great, thank you for asking. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for being with us. So to kick off, in Singapore, we are at the end of two months of circuit breaker measures uh, with four budgets of support having been delivered by the finance minister. And we're just about to enter a planned three phase reopening of society and the economy. So what is your reading as a behavioral microeconomist e uh, of where we are now? Well, I think we are, as, as you said, we're really on the brink of reopening in a very phased way. When it comes to sort of the epidemiological context here, we're past the first wave, I think, of what we saw as the initial surge of the coronavirus. But at this time, what we're seeing is that we're facing in Singapore two very different outbreaks now. We have, I think, controlled community infections, but we have what we see as an ongoing struggle um, with the outbreak in the migrant worker population. So we are, I think, in a, in a moment where when we reassess where we are from a public health perspective, looking at a very complex situation. We are safe in some ways in the sense that we have figured out for ourselves a little bit of a containment strategy. We know what we're doing, but we are more unsafe than ever in many other ways because we've revealed very deep, um, I think, tensions within our healthcare system. And we've revealed also, I think, the limits of what we can do. So we are managing, but we are also facing, um, in many ways, uh, a lot of fatigue and a lot of uncertainty as we move on to this new phase. I think many of us are excited to get back to work, back to school, back to social life. But we also understand that life after COVID is going to be very different than what we have seen before. And despite the fact that we have not one, not two, not three, but four support packages, I think grasping what that actually means in concrete terms is still very ambiguous for many people. The high levels of uncertainty as we go back uh, still persist. I think we're seeing on the scientific front um, new hopes. We're seeing that there are new treatments that are, if not curing COVID, providing some relief. We're seeing more than 80 vaccine trials in this space. And as importantly, we're now seeing advanced purchase commitments for some of those vaccines, which means that when we do get a vaccine, there will be commitments to finance that to ensure that we do get access for vast numbers of the population. So where are we now? I think we are past the first waves of uncertainty and risk. We're facing new unknowns. We're very tired, but we are seeing little bits of hope to get us through. Do you think Singapore is historically a port city, a, a city of connection. Um, will that continue to be a role it can play, uh, not merely in shipping, but of, of course as a global financial center? How is that going to be affected? The movement of, you know, we're still obviously seeing difficulties in travel and, and they will persist for the foreseeable future, but in terms of shipping, uh, transshipment of things through, through Singapore, in terms of the financial sector, all of these, 
ways in which Singapore is a node of, of connection or a hub, um, how, how, how are those things going to recover, if at all? So I think when we look at the global economy, we're looking at a very deep recession coming for all of us, globally speaking. So to the extent that these industries rebound or reform, I think there is, again, very large macro level uncertainties about the global economy. We're also seeing a fair amount of deglobalization and more local regional conversations happening everywhere. On the other hand, I think that especially with respect to the region, the comparative advantages that Singapore has, the infrastructure that it's built up and the protections that we're committing to these industries mean that when they do come back, in whatever form they come back, I think Singapore is poised to take a leading role. To what, ex what will that look like in the new economy, I think is, is still a very large question. When that recovery will happen, how strong it will be, is also very much in question, but I think there's no doubt that we'll still maintain many of the comparative advantages that we've had and that we're very actively working to keep that the case. I want to pick up on something you said, deglobalization and local and regional conversations happening. As someone who sort of came of age in, in, uh, in the period of globalization and aware of, of course, there's many advantages, but then the significant criticisms that have been leveled to some of the excesses of, of, of globalization. In what ways can deglobalization be a, a good thing? Well, I think in some sense, looking at what it means to be sustainable in looking at building networks with the local economies, local communities, and looking really towards the resources that we have and building up capacities locally, I think that can be a good thing. I mean, globalization has always been something that not only brings huge amounts of benefit, but large amounts of risk, and we're seeing those risks manifested today. I think in many, in many instances, Singapore, I myself am a new Singaporean. I've been a, a new citizen for, for a few years now. I think in many instances, looking outwards has been a, a very strong aspect of learning from the world for Singapore. But in, there are many strengths, I think, in the Singapore population. And, and looking inwards, I think, to build those capacities and our own resilience is something that can be a very positive effect of this entire pandemic. So speaking as, as, as someone who works in a small organization in the cultural sector uh, that I suppose in economic terms could be considered a SME, probably more, more on the S of, than, than an M, um, what, what does this economic recession, what does the gradual possible recovery mean for SMEs? How many will make it through? Uh, what's going to happen if people don't make it through? So I think the SME sector and then the micro SME sector in particular, so organizations that have less than 10 employees, are, is really the sector that we worry a lot about. I think in, in, in Asia more generally, about 90% of our employment is in the micro, small, medium enterprise sector, and not just the registered businesses, but also informal businesses. And I think what we worry a lot about is that in this sector, so much of the financing is hand to mouth. We are very cash dependent. What comes in goes out almost immediately. And moreover, the access to financing that we have tends to be very informal. So SMEs draw on personal savings, personal finance, friends, families, and then bank financing, for example. So for many of them, access to finance has already been like a very important constraint. So my sense is that what we're seeing here, and, and again, in, in some respects, the support packages have been responsive to this, is that this sector is particularly vulnerable to the kind of global disruption that we're seeing, that basically... What, we're, what we have in place because of lockdown measures, as well as the fear of, of the disease itself, really cuts off the lifeline for many SMEs. And again, I think we've talked about this as well, the representation of heritage businesses in the SME sector, the lifeblood really of what we're seeing of what it means to be Singaporean, um, really lives in the SME sector. So to the extent that the SME sector is having trouble surviving and many of these small enterprises may go under and not come back, we're talking about a loss that is not just economic in terms of livelihood, but really also cultural in many ways. And in practical terms, like a heritage business could mean a hawker store where the recipe has been passed down four or five generations or a bakery or a, a, a restaurant. I'm trying, I'm trying to think of things other than food uh, that, 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 are, that also I can very carry, I carry very culture. hard for myself to think about things other than food. <laughs> but yes, so in fact, a hawker business, well, in, in, in some sense, we were already before the, and let's not, let's, not, let's not beat around the bush. It's not that you know, we had this, this wonderful world before the pandemic and the crisis has really created these things. It's that even before the pandemic, we had a lot of challenges creating linkages for many of these types of enterprises. And we had hawkers 
we had hawker businesses which remain in the family for so many years where at the end of the day because of generational shifts and preferences we found with people found it very difficult to carry those through right or we found for example small bookshops niche bookshops that uh, that really find it very hard to sustain themselves in the change of reading culture for example are also areas where we found it very hard to sustain that even in the pre-covid area but what we're seeing now is this massive shock in demand very suddenly that's just hitting these businesses exactly where they need to be and cutting off this day-to-day uh, -day lifelines and many of these resource many of these enterprises don't have the background resources to be able to make it through in the way that a large organization might have. So I suppose the question that is in the back of everyone's mind is, is there any way, not just the Singapore government, but any government could have balanced the public health uh, concerns and priorities with the need to sustain small businesses or SMEs uh, in this way? So if humanly possible. Inhumanly possible. I think it's been it's been very challenging. I think this trade-off has been challenging for governments around the world, trying to balance the human cost against the economic cost, or trying to sort of understand that the human cost is the economic cost in, in many ways, and these are very tightly linked. My sense is that in particular systems where, for example, healthcare is contingent on employment, such as the United States, what we're seeing is particularly tragic consequences because when you lose your job, you also lose access to healthcare. And in those situations, we're seeing that, and in, in America, I think many small businesses are also, the, the heart of America is also small business, that, that's been very challenging when we don't have a social protection system and a healthcare protection system that's very strong, then we see particular vulnerabilities. Do I think that in, in any government in particular has been very, very, uh, very responsive in terms of the emergency measures? I think we haven't. In my, in my opinion, all governments around the world are struggling with these very similar issues because we have so little knowledge about the virus itself. We are building the public health and economic package as we go along. And because of that, I think it is too early for us to call success for any government, actually. So how does this affect uh, issues of labor rights, uh, the labor movement, employment? What is the new normal are there is there a fork in the road where we could sort of choose to go down uh, one way in a more progressive sense about looking at uh, how employment is seen uh, as a result of this pandemic uh, are there perhaps other paths that might not be so progressive or productive or fair that we should avoid that we, that we should be aware of um my sense is that what we're seeing today is that unemployment or, or there, there's two things that we can do when, we, when it comes to a social protection system. One is to sort of protect incomes, protect welfare, and the other is to protect jobs. And I think what we're seeing today is that in many, in many situations, governments can elect to do one or both. And governments today that are looking at broad social protection in the wake of a situation where it's very unclear what the employment outlook is going to look like in the future, are going to do a little better at weathering the storm. Whether or not this leads to, what, what this means for economic growth after the crisis has passed, I think is something that remains to be seen. But I think what we're seeing today is that building social protection nets that are separate from employment is one direction to go. One of the, I think, trends before um, COVID-19 that we'd all been thinking about very strongly is uh, the rise of what we call the gig economy or the freelance economy and what that meant. Absolutely. And I think one of the concerns that we had even before COVID-19 was what does the gig economy mean for things like retirement and healthcare? Because we know, for example, in Singapore, that getting self-employed people to contribute to CPF is something that is, is very challenging. And once we lose these safety nets that are not on the front of people's minds, it's very challenging for, for people to focus on the long term, given the short term exigencies of the market. I think that these, these underlying tensions and concerns are going to persist. But I think we now understand that in order to be resilient, we have to build a basic social safety net for everyone. Do you, do you, do you see uh, any likelihood of that uh, entering serious pol political consideration in Singapore? Um, well, I think we've seen it emerge in discussions of universal basic income. So we've had discussions of you know, this kind of model in the past in Singapore, and I don't think that they've been taken extremely seriously but i think 
in the last couple of months, we've seen this being raised in more spheres. And again, I don't want to speculate on whether or not this is an idea that can get traction, but I will say that we have seen more people taking this more seriously, and we'll be seeing more discussion of this going forward. I mean, the, the, I think the issue of the gig economy and freelancers uh, is, is, is one that is of particular concern to us in the art sector. The performing arts is an industry that depends on highly skilled freelancers uh, moving from artistic creation to creation, production to production. Uh, the structural limitations of running an arts troupe uh, are such that you cannot have a permanent company of actors. It's, 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 it's almost impossible. Uh, so everyone sort of moves in between. And this has been, this has been the situation for a while. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is while you have a job support scheme that in the most recent budget uh, extends to 50% of full-timer salaries in Singapore, you don't have provisions, let's say, to make up for losses uh, that, a, that a company paid out to freelancers when the show couldn't go on because of the pandemic. But let's mm -hmm. say in our case, we were able to honor, we decided to honor the full contractual uh, fee, even though there was no show and there was no income for the company. Uh, so there's no, there's no recognition that, that the industry is constructed such that your full timers who pay CPF and are on a, on a, on a, on a full-time wage only constitute a small portion of the human resources required for that industry to function. There's still a little bit of that gap in understanding and it's problematic for the, the employers uh, mm -hmm. who are unable to recoup losses that went out out of goodwill to freelancers and it's much more problematic for the freelancers themselves because there is there's very little income protection. Um, and it's strange because I think the gig economy was, uh, I mean, there's, you're, you're far more familiar with the many criticisms uh, of it, but it's a strange thing to apply to the arts because the level of education and training and skill required to participate in it is so high. People are not interchangeable. Uh, it mm -hmm. is not, it's not that it's someone so happens like you call a grab, a grab driver and uh, the algorithm finds the person who's more or less closest to you. There's nothing like that. Um, there's years of training that has to go into it, not just performers, uh, arts managers, designers, technical, technical personnel. So on our side, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to think of how the industry can survive in these conditions mm -hmm. when you have, uh, rather imperfect systems of support for the employers and uh, even more fragile and tenuous systems of support for the, for the, for the freelance employees uh, in that sector. So I think what we're concerned about is an, a complete collapse of the uh, mm. sector overall because of you, if you have this one important part of staffing and making works of art possible, if that part is, is not viable, uh, we're, we're going to see problems. I, 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 I was rather concerned by, um, there was a recent survey of arts practitioners in Singapore uh, done by Terence Tan. Uh, and the fact, what he found is that I believe three quarters of respondents had lost more than 50% of their income and something mm -hmm. like 55% of respondents had lost more than 80% of their income. Uh, and that resulted in only about 43% of them saying they wanted, they felt confident remaining in the arts. So if we have possible flight of say 57%, yeah, 57 two thirds um, or four, you know, three fifths of uh, trained arts practitioners, if they leave the profession, when we recover, it's going to be enormously difficult to, to, to come back to the level of production, of quality, of responsiveness to um, the environment. So I think that is a systemic challenge that, right. that arts SMEs are, are, are facing uh, in terms of that. No, I would agree. And I think that there's also, the problem is that when we lose a cohort of skilled practitioners, it's very, it's doubly hard to recover from that. Uh, so one of the one of the, the pieces of work that I've been involved in, in the past is, is going to look at countries like Cambodia, where we try to look at the healthcare system in Cambodia. And what we find is that because of the particular historical experience of Cambodia, an entire generation uh, 
of, for example, doctors and skilled practitioners just, just disappeared, which not only means that we lose that moment, but we lose the mentorship and we lose the guidance for successive generations. And so if we lose this cohort of skilled practitioners today from the arts, what that means is that it has ripple effects for generations of art practitioners going forward. So even if we come back economically, that pipeline is very severely disrupted. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've seen that historically in times of repression. If you look at the Cultural Revolution in China and the interruption uh, to, to the dissemination uh, of cultural knowledge and various art forms of practitioners who suffered in, in, in exile or um, uh, internal exile uh, or punishment. Or if you look at the massacres in Cambodia, um, I, I, you, you, know, you see this, this irretrievable loss of heritage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and here it may be happening, you know, for economic reasons, if there is no systemic bailout. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it's always very difficult for the arts, arts practitioners to be able to mount a case for a industry-wide bailout in the way that aviation could say, oh, we need a bailout, or banks could say, we need a bailout. Um, I, yeah, I think that's that's the challenge that that all of us face, and in able to to put it in those terms that as right. an industry it can benefit from a support package to avoid a systemic failure. Right, I think that that the argument there also is that unlike other industries, once you lose that very particular and specific cultural capital, it's not that you can remake it in the image of something else, because the authenticity I think is a key component of right. what you need. Right? What, we, what we don't want is to lose an entire cultural sector and then come back to some kind of disnification because what we're doing now is copying an image of something that we had before. If you think about something like the Cultural Revolution, right? when we lose the specific figures that we have that underpin the sector, it's not that we can go off and get a blueprint and remake it. That's not how it works. Exactly, exactly. So turning, uh, well, we, we can maybe come back to the cultural sector later, but I, I want to get your thoughts on how the pandemic has affected things like education and parenting, uh, and mentorship, mentorship uh, and dissemination of knowledge of a different kind. Well, I will tell you that I, I am basically a failed home-based learner <laughs> coach. Um, my sense is that, you know, and uh, that what, like many other industries, I think education had been toying with the idea of digitalization for a very long time. And we've all been thinking about going online and using Sort of like the digital world to enhance learning but we really got shoved off this cliff and and now we've been forced to fly what has that meant for us we're exploring new paradigms for education we're trying to understand how to make it work in this digital world and at this moment we're not doing particularly well my sense is um whether we will come back to a world in which we have face-to-face -face education very soon i think is very unlikely and so at the end of the day what we're beginning to realize is that we will have to adapt and we have to adapt our practices and what we're going to have to do is understand not just how to convey skills but really that level of socialization and social education which is going to be missing um, or rather transformed in a very specific way with social distancing but i think with education the education sector in general we're going to have to learn a lot about the pedagogy of digital of digital learning but we'll also have to learn a lot about teaching other things we will have to teach, learn a lot about teaching grit resilience adaptation to this new world we actually again in the education sector these conversations about grit resilience facing new worlds of, of uncertainty and uncertain employment were all conversations that had started before the pandemic but in some sense the what the pandemic has done is made those issues paramount and we really cannot escape those discussions they're no longer nice to have discussions they are things that we need to talk about today so does that return the burden of, of socialization and of uh, inculcating these traits of resilience to the family environment? Uh, it, it sort of predating a time uh, of formal education, a formal state-controlled education. Somewhat, somewhat. I will tell you that I read a piece the other day that said, oh, it's uh, the one, one bright side of the pandemic is that we can no longer outsource the education of our children. And as a working mother myself, I took great offense to this, actually. I, didn't, I, I, I felt, you know, I don't outsource my children's education. I rely on a network of trained professionals who actually are much more qualified than myself in many ways. I have an extended network of family, of people who I 
clearly contract with to raise my child in a village. And so in many ways, I think the fact that we no longer have this village, whether it's a village we pay for or it's an extended village of community, um, that village has shrunk in many ways and will continue to shrink for a little while is a real loss, is a real loss. There are many things that the family can do or the immediate family can do and should do. And I, I do acknowledge, I think, that many of those things, it's important for us to, to realize that perhaps in many ways we did abdicate some of that responsibility in this, in this capitalist lifetime. But at the same time, there has been a real loss of the community environment. The other thing I think which is very important for us to understand is that um, there is homeschooling by choice. And there are people for whom the home is not an environment for many children to thrive. And so yeah. what we're seeing, for example, in this, in this particular situation, even in Singapore, but really globally, are that for many children, being at home is not a safe environment. That the role models that they have at the home are not role models that we would wish for them in a broader social setting. And that these very vulnerable members of society are actually at risk. And we're seeing, for example, more calls to domestic violence helplines and to family violence helplines in this time. So the idyllic idea of the home as a safe haven, uh, where we, we sort of reinvent these ways of, of educating our child, is not really true for many people in society. That's a very good point. And it, it also reopens the, the a perennially ignored question of the systematic undervaluing of the of caregivers when it's primarily a gendered issue right it's it's usually females who are tasked with unpaid caregiving uh, and and domestic work uh, globally yeah and i think it's it's a it's a known fact i mean if we look for example at research productivity which happens to be my industry what we're seeing is that what the pandemic has done is that it's dropped productivity rates for women and increased it for men, particularly single men who have no family responsibilities. And what we're seeing now is that women who I think have made tremendous progress in Singapore in terms of, of uh, evening out sort of income differentials and education differentials and, and really have made very, very large progress in gender equality in the last 20 years, we're seeing that now what's happened in the pandemic is that we're falling back on these gender norms and we're seeing women shouldering the home-based learning and we're seeing women shouldering the informal caregiving and also bearing most of the mental load of organizing this. So not just the physical load of the opportunity cost of not being able to get out there, but really the mental burden of making sure that they have all of the schedules coordinated, all of the operating of the household, all of the tasks, all of that is falling on the shoulders primarily of women. And that's a problem for us because that is a regression. So what needs to happen, particularly in the Singapore context, for that to change? Oh, primarily men. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I, think, I think if we, see, if we see a situation where at the end of the day, we do have universal provisions to enable work from home in a way that's, that's really, that really takes the burden off the individual, we'll see less of the scarcity that forces people into those roles. I think as we also see home-based learning that becomes... Um, and again, I want to applaud the Ministry of Education because what I've seen from the home-based learning actually has been a tremendous effort on the part of teachers really making do in an incredible crisis situation. But once we adapt to more regularized home-based learning and everyone understands a little better what's going on, the hope is that making things, lifting the tide for everyone will lift the mental burden, particularly for women. And I hope those accommodations will take place. And I think that if we see in general, more conversations happening about the value of caregiving. And hopefully the men who are at home and can now see what it really takes on a day-to-day -day basis, that there's more recognition that there has to be, that this is a real cost and a real job, taking care of your children, your elderly parents, your spouse at home. Hopefully those will change the conversations that we have about accommodations. How and how also would a more equitable outlook uh, on employment and undervalued labor, uh, how would that affect how we look at so-called unskilled labor? And that's the, obviously it's a debate that's come up a lot in light of the widespread of uh, COVID-19 among the micro worker community. Uh, I mean, there's, there's arguments that, oh, if these jobs were paid better, then they could be done uh, by Singaporeans. There's sort of larger jobs that if the global, sorry, larger points that if the global economic system did not result in uh, such, such great inequalities in other countries, people would not have 
a low income country to flee in order to come to, to this one in order to work. I mean, I think, how, how do you see all these systems interlocking and is there any micro solution that Singapore should be looking at? Oh, well, I, I, I think that if we took the word, we, it's really about low wage labor. Okay. Even if we took the word foreign out of that, I think we have many conversations about low wage workers in Singapore that would be exactly the same. So we had to think about this as a systemic problem. The disparities and difficulties that we have with the foreign worker population are very real, but we also should not ignore the fact that we also are having these conversations about the auntie that works in the hawker center, the uncle that is you know, collecting cardboard boxes or selling tissue paper by the road. We have these conversations about the parents who tell their children that if they don't study, they're going to grow up to be the garbage man. And uh, these, are, well, these are all conversations that are about the valuing of care work or skill or what we perceive to be low skill work and why we see these vast differentials in our, in our society. Um, I would say that these conversations again need to change and I hope they will change. My fear is that they will not change. They require very radical revisioning of not just our economic system, but our value system. Um, for example, people might ask, do we think that after the pandemic, we'll see that nurses are paid more, that our skilled healthcare workers are actually given the kind of respect and salaries that they deserve on the front line? And uh, they may be, but we haven't seen yet that happening. And if we don't see that happening now, I don't know if we'll see that happening going forward. I think in, in many of the governments that we've seen that we look up to, we've seen voluntary pay cuts at the top in order to support people at the, at the bottom of the pyramid. Will we see that continuing after COVID-19? I think that's a very open question. Which is maybe a good, a good way to transition to talking about healthcare. I mean, it's a thing that's on everyone's mind and the healthcare system, which has you know, worked incredibly hard. Uh, and these discussions about whether they should be better paid or given better working conditions uh, have, have been at the forefront, not just in Singapore, but you know, many worse off uh, healthcare systems in other, in other countries. As someone who looks at the intersection of healthcare policy and, and uh, economics, um, what do you think of the way forward in Singapore? I mean, uh, there, there are a couple of things. I think one is that we've had to sit back and, and become very humble about what we've achieved. Um, maybe just about last year, I was writing an article with someone on the Singapore health system and very confidently saying that infectious disease was no longer an issue for us and we could look forward to challenges of chronic disease and aging. Um, and of course, all of that has gone you know, out, of, out of the window. I think what we're going to be seeing in the healthcare sector is firstly that we begin to understand that first uh, that primarily these epidemic threats are not a thing of the past, that we need to be much more humble about what we where we are relative to pathogens, relative to things like antimicrobial resistance that have been at the back of our minds, but can be very real threats. Um, in terms of healthcare technologies, I think we're looking now very clearly towards digital health the use of artificial intelligence, the fact that we collect all of this data, but that we need to be able to manage it appropriately to get good predictions out of it. It's a very powerful tool. We're going to be asking ourselves a lot of questions now about ethics, data collection, and surveillance, and how we make that happen in order to achieve both a high quality, the best quality healthcare we can deliver, as well as patient protection and patient rights. And we're also going to be asking ourselves a lot of questions about the social determinants of health. And the fact that a lot of things that determine health outcomes are rooted in the social conditions in which people live. It's really not about health care. It's really about health. And last but not least, I think we're going to be talking about financing health care. One of the things I think that has made it very clear um, that financing is important is that in Singapore, one of, the, one of the great things about how we responded to COVID was to make sure that health care financing was not an issue for COVID patients at the beginning and that if you had issues, you would come in, get tested, get treated. This is, you know, we can draw contrast to other countries, which we won't name, in which the cost of getting tested, the cost of getting treated for COVID is something that makes people hesitant to go into an emergency room. And what, we've begun to, what we have begun to see is that healthcare financing is also very critical. I think last but not least in the healthcare sector, uh, we begin to understand that the technology is only one piece of this and that human behavior is really important. We're going to be seeing a new epidemic, I think, of mental health 
coming on the coming hot on the heels of this pandemic. So we're going to have to worry about issues that we've never thought about as deeply as we should have before. And we're going to have to think about what this means going forward because our mental health infrastructure to date has been sadly underdeveloped. I want to go back to what you said about a radical re-envisioning of um, our values, not just the systems, but the values. And, and I think uh, we all labor in, in Singapore, often extremely usefully um, with the metric of, of KPIs, key performance mm. uh, indicators. Um, when I heard the, what is I'm sure is a commonplace for many, many people, when I heard the phrase a few years ago, you become what you measure, uh, it's, it's really struck me, it really struck me uh, that it's important to pay attention to what we are measuring. Uh, and I do wonder for those of us who look at things from a more socially progressive perspective, how do we insert systems of measurement, um, metrics, KPIs uh, into how we structure society that take into account social justice, uh, mental health, well-being, uh, ecological balance, um, things like the arts and, and culture in intangibles like that, that, that contribute so much to the experience of being human. Well, I think that's a challenge across all uh, sectors, really, that have to do with these intangible values. A lot of times, I, I absolutely agree, what happens is that we count the things that are easy to count. And so when we look, for example, at uh, cultural statistics of Singapore, we can tell you that in 2019, there were 9,200 and I think 53 performances in Singapore and X number of tickets. And those are very concrete and easy for us to measure as process outputs, but they don't tell us about the real impact of those things. And so we end up counting the number of incidences and we don't measure the actual outcome because they're difficult to measure, not because they're so important, but because they are so difficult to measure. At the end of the day, um, if we look at what, what we do try to measure in Singapore, when we look at the value of a sector, we talk a lot about economic indicators. So very often we'll look at the number of, 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 of firms or enterprises in a sector and we'll say, um, this is the total value added to GDP. This is the total number of jobs created. If we're a little more creative, we'll say, well, this is the multiplier effect of the industry. So, for example, the arts and culture create spillover effects for tourism. They create spillover effects for F&B. And in fact, everyone who's employed in the arts and culture sector goes out and spends that money. Right. Um, and so there is a, a larger spillover, a larger indirect effect on GDP as well. We're a little more creative that way. And at the end of the day, we say, OK, but there are also these effects beyond the economic dollars and cents. The arts culture, for uh, the arts sector, for example, has a very strong uh, impact on the quality of life of individuals. People value it in many ways. Um, it creates not just immediate well-being, but education that is involved in the arts increases resiliency, creates creativity, improves the well-being of older adults. It has a lot of actual effects on the individual well-being of citizens. And beyond that. Beyond that, it has this sort of public goods effect. It creates social cohesion, creates an ability to empathize, it creates a national identity, it builds among all of us a sense of community. And all of these effects are, the more we get, the more we get towards that end of the spectrum, the more challenging it is for us to measure, unfortunately. So we have very good measures for process and counting the beans. We have relatively good measures of direct economic impact and indirect economic impact we have some good measures for individual well-being. So we can measure, for example, um, with a quality adjusted life year or value of, we have, we have lots and lots of, of very exciting and somewhat cold-blooded measures of what an increase in indexes of well-being means in terms of dollars and cents. So for the health sector, for example, we can value um, a quality adjusted life year in actual country GDP measures. So we can measure individual well-being. We can also ask you, what your willingness to pay is or your, for, for a cultural institution. So we have very creative ways of asking people, if we took away the National Museum, what would you pay us to get it back? Mm -hmm. So we can put a dollar value on those private uh, valuations of cultural institutions. But the public value, the value of social cohesion, the value of that national identity, that's something we find very challenging and most economic frameworks do not include that. 
And I want to sort of say that for policymakers, it's not that it's not that these things are not important. It's that they are so important that we don't agree on how to do it. And sometimes we say that if we're going to come up with a difficult measure, we might as well not measure it at all if it's going to be so biased and inaccurate. It's, it's easy for us to say that policymakers are just care about dollars and cents, but in many ways, it is very difficult because policymakers ask themselves, a dollar spent on the arts has a large opportunity cost because it's not a dollar spent on the education system. It's not a dollar spent on social welfare. It's not a dollar spent giving a transfer of a voucher for, for an older adult who has to go and get a medical checkup. So there is a strong opportunity cost to that dollar. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we can only measure so far. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of it, there is a little bit of a leap of faith. To what extent can the arts and culture sector assist policymakers in making that leap of faith? My, my sense is that uh, at the end of the day, it's many Singaporean policymakers, and again, I'll, I'll say this having sort of seen policymakers in other countries as well, um, actually are very, are not the technocrats that we see in many other systems. And that there is, I think, a very real desire to see the bigger picture. And I think the arts and cultural sector are able, I think, to speak emotively to that and to advocate for themselves in important ways. I think in some sense, the education system in Singapore, by building in arts education, in the last 10 or 20 years has built the foundation for policymakers to hear those arguments. I think what's important is for the arts and cultural sector equally to learn to speak that language. So for example, at Research for Impact, we try to train people in, across the nonprofit sector to understand economics, to understand what it means to have evidence-based practice, evidence-based research. So I think understanding that language and being able to speak in the metrics that, that at least there is a common bridge across those sectors is actually very important. So economics, you know, we're not very popular economists. Nobody likes us. We're, we're terrible people. But at the end of the day, if you don't speak the language of economics, uh, like the one, I think it was Joan Robinson who said that the idea of understanding economists is so that you won't be fooled by economists. And that's the idea. I think being able to be interdisciplinary, both from the point of view of the policymaker, but also from the arts and cultural sector, I think is very helpful. The difficulty that we face, I think, um, and I'll of course speak for myself, um, I'm sure my colleagues are much better at it uh, than I am, is, is going back to your point about asking people what they would pay to say, get the museum back. Uh, I, I, I think we are the victims, let's say, in the performing arts, of a trend towards the expectation that in particular online content should be free. Mm. Uh, so that's caught us at a particularly, uh, I mean, this is a terrible time for this trend to be in effect. Uh, we have something like three years ago, 2017, 40% of Singaporeans admitted that they consume pirated online content. Uh, NAC research from a couple of years ago showed that 63% of arts consumers expected online content to be free. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at precisely the time when theatres are closed for completely understandable public health reasons, and they will continue to be closed for m several months, and even when they reopen, there will be social distancing measures, checkerboard seating to the effect that essentially you can really only have 30% capacity, making it financially um, extraordinarily difficult to mount a, a performing arts uh, production. Um, with those measures in place, it, and we're all being asked to migrate, online, uh, the huge question is how do we monetize? Mm. So Checkpoint Theatre, in terms of our artistic practice, we are very fortunate in that organically, we have diversified over the years to work uh, across different platforms in media. So mm. we are looking, besides our core competency of, of live theatre, we're also working in music, we're looking at online videos, we're looking at graphic novels, uh, video games, uh, a, a, whole, a whole host of ways of telling original Singapore stories because we have the benefit of working with live creators. So a large family of uh, 20, 25 people who we can have calls with and say, oh, this is a great idea. We can't do it as a play right now. Uh, what about thinking, does it work in this other medium? 
Um, and because the people that we work with are, are inherently multidisciplinary and cross platform, I think all of those things are possible. But yet there remains, even if there's structural uh, opportunities or availabilities in, in those other platforms, there's still the question of monetization. Mm. And I do think this is at, at this current historical juncture globally, you can't reverse it uh, because there has been such, um, I mean, if you consider it's a thought experiment, if Singapore, for instance, which has historically had very good law enforcement in many spheres, uh, if they had cracked down on piracy consistently to the point where nobody would ever pirate uh, software or nobody would actually expect they could see any film, any television show uh, online for free. If that had been part of the culture, then we could also quite easily transition to uh, a situation where we could ask people to pay for online content for things that are more on the art side of the spectrum as opposed to entertainment. But that's not, that hasn't been the case. So I think the, the, the huge structural challenge for us now is how does, how does anything get paid for? Uh, people are fond in, in cultural circles of, of pointing to the example of Shakespeare. Oh, during the Black Death, Shakespeare wrote King Lear, Shakespeare managed to survive. Uh, I think if you, one, one does a bit of digging, um, I think it's actually profoundly depressing the ways in which Shakespeare in, in the Black Death in England was in a much better position than any arts practitioner is in, Singa is in Singapore because 1593 to 1596 or, and 1603, 1604 theatres are closed in London because of the bubonic plague. But Shakespeare's troupe can travel to the provinces to perform uh, and thereby derive income. There are no provinces here globally. You cannot go anywhere. You cannot mount a show anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, Shakespeare was also able to, to survive because of uh, wealthy patrons who derived their income from agriculture. They were landowners, and so they could, they could fund him. Uh, most patrons today or sponsors, be they individuals or, or corporations, are all part of the same financial system where everyone is seeing, is seeing their portfolios drop 50% or more. So patrons are drying up. Uh, Shakespeare was able to transition to uh, writing poetry during that time because he had private patrons who would pay for poetry. We are very happy as storytellers to transition to other media, to other platforms. But again, it comes back to the question of who is going to, to pay for all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final terrible um, historical lesson from Shakespeare is that actually we probably only know about Shakespeare because so many of his contemporaries were wiped out by the bubonic plague. And I'm not just talking they, like, they died, but economically those troops were wiped out. So uh, a lot of his contemporaries, especially those that dealt with, that had young, young performers because they were you know, more susceptible to the bubonic plague, uh, they were not able to continue. And so Shakespeare actually, Shakespeare's king's men sort of stepped over metaphorically their bodies in order to assume his place. He took over Blackfriars Theatre because two other companies uh, went out of business. So I don't want in the Singapore context for Checkpoint Theatre, say, for our survival to come only because other companies uh, have died out, other companies haven't survived. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, in as much as, in as much, in as much as everybody wants to be able to continue making art, uh, and everyone wants to continue practicing their craft, uh, I do think there are very real structural problems in, in, in enabling people to to survive, to 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 pay their rent, to put food on the table, to take care of their families in the three, six, nine months that it's going to take for us to to reopen um, theatres. And so I think that's the, that's the concern that we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the arts in Singapore. And as you pointed out at the beginning, there's this really very little easy solution. Uh, there are very few easy solutions apparent for policymakers. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree. I think that, I think just picking up on that trend, what we're, what we're gonna see is that people who are in a position of strength before the crisis, Right, have the resources, have the ability to see themselves through and find themselves in a landscape that is decimated, right. Right, will have an advantage. And there are industries now that are growing incredibly quickly because of this. I think in digital health, we're seeing just a takeoff. 
But at the end of the day, when we're dealing with something where, as you said, there is a collective identity around the industry and we don't see, we don't want to see this monopoly structure emerging by default. And in some sense, the richness of the industry depends on the diversity of players in it. Right? This is not an outcome that we want to see. It's exactly. not an outcome that we want to see. And I think, again, it's, uh, it is, what we're seeing now, I think, and just looking at the, at the type of funding that is, is being put out to the arts and culture and the creative services industry, we're seeing a lot of emphasis on digitalization grants. Yep. We're seeing a lot of, 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 of the support being very conditional in many ways. And so I think the conditionality of that support is also going to make in the arts and culture sector, but also in the social and everywhere, right? Pre-existing disparities open more widely. And that's going to be very challenging for all of us. Absolutely. And, 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 and while broadly speaking in the arts community, we're very welcoming of uh, NACs uh, and the ministry's uh, support measures. Uh, we know they're on a personal level, they're, they're really trying very hard and they're exceptionally concerned and invested in the, the survival of the system. I think there are some questions thrown up by the nature of the support schemes. I mean, you mentioned the digital presentation grant. Um, so as is sort of now emerge, it, it only supports projects that are rated G, general in nature. And, and the classification system in Singapore is G, advisory, advisory 16, and R18. Uh, and I, just out of curiosity, I, did a, I, did a, I asked my colleagues to do an analysis of um, the shows that were put up in 2019 to see mm -hmm. organically the, the domestic production from theater companies. And we looked at the major companies, which is a sort of specific term that NAC gives to those who are recipients of major company funding. Uh, and we found that, that G ratings were only given to 27.8% 27, of productions if you excluded things that were explicitly intended for children. So just over a quarter of things are organically rated uh, G. So when you only fund G rated works, you are excluding probably the 75% of artistic production in Singapore that you would normally do. Um, so while I'm glad that NEC is funding uh, digital work, I mean, I, I do think there's a serious problem in structuring it such that 75% of production uh, wouldn't get funded. Um, yeah. I think there's, there's, there's also very generous training schemes that are on offer, but I think as many people have pointed out, uh, training sets you up for when you are able to work again, but does not at all help you uh, when you are unable to work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, there was a recent, uh, in a reply by Senior Parliamentary Secretary Bayam King to a, a question in Parliament, he said that he's spoken to arts practitioners and they would prefer to do meaningful work rather than receive handouts. Um, and I would agree, only to the point that you actually think you've, you've actually phrased it in terms of handouts. Uh, people don't like to receive a handout, uh, but if we rephrased it or rethought of it as a bailout, uh, it's a sector that is ailing throughout and desperately needs help in order to survive. Uh, banking in the global financial crisis wouldn't get a handout, they got a bailout. Aviation is getting a bailout, not a handout. So I think the argument that us in the art sector would need to mount, uh, hopefully with the aid of, of sympathetic uh, economists uh, like yourself, is, is, is how do we qualify for a bailout? Uh, and let's not think of it in terms of a handout. Because no, nobody wants a handout. But we do have a deep belief in the value that we bring to Singapore society and telling Singapore stories, not just to each other, but for a global stage. And I think we want structurally to be able to survive. Absolutely. And no one is in a better place than the arts and culture sector to understand that language matters, framing matters. These things change the psychology of how we receive, um, how we receive incentives and they change how we respond to those incentives. And so absolutely, I think this is very important. Um, the other thing that I would say is that as we are thinking about what it means to enter this new world where we have more surveillance at all times, where the compact between government and people is changing, having a uh, arts and culture sector that has the means to, to ask difficult questions, not G-rated questions, is going to be more important than ever. What are we going to need? I think the paradigms of leadership that we've seen coming out of this pandemic, are we need, 
authenticity, mm-hmm. we need empathy, we need the ability to motivate people to think about scenarios and live with, uh, with situations that they've never personally experienced. We're asking them to have faith, we're asking them to work together for others, and we're asking them to really look into a future that has not been charted before. These are things where at the end of the day, again, this is a second leap of faith, right? Who can take us there? I think someone said that the global financial crisis, and I forget who said the global financial crisis actually revealed to us the limits of finance. But what COVID-19 has shown us every day now is the limits of science, the limits of policymaking in many ways, and that it comes back to this human experience and what we do in our homes and in our heads. So the arts and cultural sector, the ability of the arts and cultural sector to survive organically and to create authentic experience that bridges individuals from very different walks of life is I think going to be more important than ever and our policymakers who really want to create like a polity that is worth I think you know growing after COVID-19 are really going to have to understand that this is something to protect. Mm-hmm. This, this, this links uh, to some of the questions that have come in um, so I'm going to to, to, to go to some of those. Uh, in response to the point about the difficulty of measuring the important things, do you see a role of storytelling as an, as an alternate paradigm for measurement, communication, and record keeping? Data science as one tool, but art and relative qualitative techniques as the other tool. Uh, I absolutely, absolutely. I am a bean counter of all bean counters. My CV is all about bean counting. But I think that the last 20 years of my career in evaluation have been about understanding the value of mixed methods. Mm -hmm. I think in order to be a good data scientist, one has to understand that big data in and of itself is only one piece of the puzzle and that there are really limits to what can be quantified and that the qualitative aspect of of the presentation of facts, the subjective nature of much of our experience is equally important. And that there are, I think the other thing that as a researcher I've begun to understand is that the quality of that storytelling, the skills, many, many data scientists, I believe, invest so much in the technical aspects of what they're doing to the data that they have. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, right, the respect for the skills of the qualitative researcher, the storyteller, the narrator, that respect has also got to be, uh, I think, built. And we need to understand how to bridge these worlds and not see them as two separate things. And that I think is very difficult. I think interdisciplinary work or transdisciplinary work is an area that we really have to build up. And and we're interestingly, even in people who come from the sciences, we're seeing success with people like Angela Merkel, for for example, who happens to be able to balance communication and quote unquote soft skills with clearly a a, a deep grasp of of the numbers, the beans. Exactly. And I think that part of the problem that we have now in the world today is that we have like a deep loss of faith in science because we've built a lot of people who can do science, but not a lot of people who can communicate about science. And mm. at the end of the day, if we have a vaccine that no one wants to take, uh, well, you know, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. Absolutely. I, 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 I've seen the, the other side of that in a class that I've been teaching uh, in the NUS uh, University Scholars Program over the last uh, five, six years. Uh, It's called From Lab to Stage, Writing the Science Play. And because, I think partly because of the way USP is structured, it brings together people in the sciences and and in in the humanities. And so I I get a lot of uh, extremely talented people uh, in the arts who maybe did triple science A-levels. And then people who are doing sciences who have always loved books and and the arts and and storytelling. And so it's a very fertile uh, mix. So people who are able to construct narratives about science or, uh, uh, you know, the social uh, human implications of, of science and technology. And I, I find, yes, you're exactly right. I think that's when it, when it does work, it's extremely exciting. And you begin to see all of human endeavor kind of click into place, like the final twist of, of the Rubik's Cube. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but, but everyday life, it often isn't, it isn't that way. No, but we force, we force the streams into arts, science and and in the in the very structuring of our education system we've done that at such an early age and i've seen you know the reversal of that a little bit i think you know in the last few years in the education science that's a very promising development and we should actually harp on that much more strongly because we need people who really don't see these two things as separate streams arts science commerce so are there sort of theories of education that are gaining currency that are are breaking down these very uh, if i'm not if i'm not mistaken very 19th century german ways of 
of dividing things into you know specializations yeah so my sense is that we are seeing that so on the one hand i think you know courses on a, on a sort of structural level courses like the international baccalaureate give people that option but even within the a level curriculum we're seeing people tentatively moving towards what they call the mixed combinations mm -hmm. right which i think is a is a step i think everything in the systems that we have involves baby steps right. um Personally, I came out of the humanities program, so I was in arts uh, A-levels, and I went into, and people were like, how can you go into maths if you have an arts A-level? It really upset people very drastically. Um, but I think we need to be able to tell the children that at the end of the day, when you're 21, right, your life should not be dictated by a decision that was made for you at the age of 17 or 18 or 19. And I think these paradigms, again, of lifelong learning, we need to also take a little more seriously. Right. So uh, I, my colleagues are reminding me that we have, we have hit an hour. So uh, I'm just going to close with one, one question. And this is a, this is a big one. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, but, but I'm really interested to see what you make of it. Capitalism seems like the only aligning principle for any discussions on policy going forward. Do you see any other possibilities for other possible paths towards organizing society? independence and cooperation facilitated in other ways not related to money perhaps any question that starts with capitalism is <laughs> is a is a big question for the last yeah. five minutes um of of the discussion so i would say firstly that uh that you know economists get a bad rep because people think that we're all about money and those are accountants by the way not economists <laughs> um, but my sense is that you know at the end of the day money is a totem Right. And what economists really say is that resources, resources are what's important. And it's hard to get away from the fact that the distribution of resources is an organizing principle that we can't get away from. Um, that being said, I think we hope that there's an awareness that these resources are more than just the tangible resources that we have. And that I think what COVID-19 is showing us is that health is an equally important resource and that people are equally important resources and that allocation of resources in a way that helps us look at the goals of equity and social justice are just as important as this mindless dependence on, on forward motion of growth, even though that is very important to sustain it, that we have to have a balanced set of goals going forward. That being said, do I think that we've seen a very, uh, I think, you know, in, uh, in the last 10 or so years, have we seen a sort of a relentless drive towards not just capitalism, but what I think some people call surveillance capitalism. So the, the general rise, not just of, of, of capitalism, but these large private and public organizations that control your data, try to predict your behavior, and sort of try to manipulate basically these things in a, in a, in a way that is very non-transparent to the individual. Have we seen that growing? Yes, we have. Has that become much more obvious to us in COVID-19? I think, yes, it has. Um, will we be able to come up with new structures of organization that are more equitable and more progressive in many ways? I think actually so. I think we are seeing an increased consciousness. I think it's going to be very challenging in many situations. We're seeing, even in some of the, the places in the world that we've considered to be bastions of democracy, in the US and the UK, we're seeing that the face of democracy is not what we thought it was. And so I think that there are going to be many challenges to making that, that happen. But I do think that this pandemic, if anything, has shown us that those goals are important, that protecting the most vulnerable is actually something that affects all of us. Well, that is a wonderful note to, to end on. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for this really invigorating and enlightening conversation. I've, I've learned so much. And thank you for, for those of you uh, watching who've participated with your comments um, and questions. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank my colleagues at Checkpoint Theatre for their work on this event. Uh, Claire Wong and Faith Ong for concept and direction, uh, Nicole Wong for research, Ishan Lam for marketing, and Isamono Yente and Adeline Lowe for logistics. A big thank you once again to Dr. Joanne Yeo. Thank you for uh, having Next me. up in Checkpoint's online programming is the audio experience of Lucas Ho's play The Heart Comes to Mind, directed by Claire Wong, that will be on the Esplanade offstage platform from June 6th for a week. So before we close, I'd like to ask you to make a donation to Checkpoint Theatre at giving.sg to support our work, and you can find the link pinned in the comments section below. So thanks again, Joanne. Thank you, everybody watching. Take care. Stay safe. Good night.